great. Um, so there are a couple of faces I know, and then a couple I don't. So I'll just introduce myself to everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Kroll. I'm uh, one of the dev leads. I'm in the Bubble Notes team, so I get to work with these awesome people all the time. And uh, I'm going to be speaking about mock programming today. So I want to start this session by sharing my first experience with mock programming. It happened about two years ago. Uh, early February 2015, I was traveling to the US to speak at a conference. And one of the things I do when I travel is I do this thing called team tourism. So the idea behind team tourism is to go and uh, spend time with another team and you do work, you observe how they're doing, and in doing so, you can learn some things that you can take home to share with your own team. And that's been a great experience. And in this instance, when I was on this trip, I was lucky enough to schedule some time with a company called Pluralsight. Mm -hmm. So Pluralsight uh, has offices all over the US, and they have a set of offices in Utah, and I'd organized to spend a day with their team in Utah. Now, my expectation um, on that day that was that I was going to sit and do pair programming with somebody the whole day. So imagine my surprise when I arrived there and they said, oh, we don't do pair programming, we do mob programming. Now, I had no clue what mob programming was. You know, it could have been go and beat up somebody, something like that. And being a good South African, I was up for anything. Um, but in the actual uh, day, it was amazing. A bunch of us stood in front of one computer working on a problem. And after that first experience, I was hooked. And since then, I've used a form of mob programming in all the teams that I've been involved with. So today I'm going to spend some time in talking about what mob programming is. You're going to get to see mob programming in the wild how it's actually done. And then we're going to go on to some of the questions that come when we talk about mob programming. And we're going to end off sharing a few insights uh, that we've gained through doing mob programming over time. Now, has anybody here done mob programming before? Okay, so the ones I know, nobody else. Mm. Okay. So I would be really interested to find out if you try this, what your experiences are like, and what the challenges you face. Um, and just to share some more stories. We we'll really love it. Um, so before I go into the spe specifics of mob programming, I want to start off with a quote. Uh, let's go there. And the quote is, the value of another's experience is to give us hope, not to tell us how or where to proceed. And that's really important. I'm not here to tell you you need to do mob programming. Uh, that's not my purpose. The reason I'm here today is just to share an experience we've had in the hope that it inspires you to try something. Now, if you actually end up trying mob programming, that's great. But if you try something else, that's great as well. Um, it's in seeing what other people do that inspires us to try new things. And ultimately, if we get that right, we're in a good place. Um, so I also want to speak about something that's really fundamental to mob programming. It originates from uh, extreme programming. And it's a mistake we often make. So often we focus on the bad, the things that we're doing wrong. And extreme programming changed that mindset. They said, instead of focusing on the things you get wrong, focus on the good and turn that up. And I see mob programming as an evolution of that in focusing on some things that worked and just turning that dial up to max. And if we keep embracing turning things up higher, like we're gonna get better and better at what we do. So with that, what is mob programming? Well, quite simply, mob programming is when three or more people work together to solve a problem at one computer. Like fundamentally, that's what we mean when we talk about mob programming. And the exciting thing about mob programming is it's growing in popularity. It's happening all over the world. So if I can navigate my computer properly, 
I've done a quick collection of teams all over the world doing mob programming. There are teams in the UK doing it. Uh, there are teams in South Africa that were doing it. Uh, in Sweden. Well, Sweden, Spain. Uh, so if you see people that close together when they're mobbing, there's a problem, they're a bit too close. So just keep that in mind, like environment, environment uh, is important. And what I want you to just see from this is there are companies all over the world adopting this practice. This isn't just one group of people that are doing these things. Uh, this was the team that I spent with when I was in the States. Uh, some of these guys are actual plural site uh, authors. Um, and there's some amazing results. Uh, this is a company uh, also based in California. They've got, well, they have six teams here doing mob programming. They've extended this to eight teams doing mob programming. And what do you know? Like, <laughs> does this look familiar? Um, so. Let's talk about uh, mob probing in the wild. Now it's a thing in the mob probing community to do time-lapse videos of you working. And it just so happens that I did a time-lapse video, not of my current team, no surprise, but of my previous team that I was working in. And I want to walk, walk you through what we were doing. So let's start off at the very beginning. So this is our work environment. What you can't see here is there's a big 60 inch screen in front of us. We also have a smaller screen to the right that has a timer that's counting down in 10 minute intervals. Um, you'll see we have a very large table, comfortable enough to have several keyboards because uh, different people had preferences on different keyboards. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, we're rotating that keyboard amongst us. So at any one time there's a typist and that's busy rotating around. You also see that we have people that kind of visit us while we're mobbing. This guy just came to see how we were doing and he went off, came back with some ideas that he uh, thought that would help us. And that's one of the real benefits I've seen from our program. It's almost this like organic commentary that comes from it. You also see that while we're working, like everybody is engaged. They're all staring at the problem. So it's not a case of you type while I check my cell phone and kind of relax. We're all being engaged in a conversation. We also have our uh, product owner, who would sit right over there. And if we were uh, needing him, he was always nearby to uh, give us insights. Uh, you'll see there he's busy just hanging around. Um, and if there were meetings, we have meetings in that area. So it's a very organic way of working. We're going, we're going, we're going. Typically we would break for lunch. And if we break for lunch, we all kind of break for lunch at the same time. And then we'd get back together after that. Let's see who comes back first from lunch. Uh, coming back from lunch. Ah, oh, it's me. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Mob of one. Uh, and so we continue. And you see everyone's still going. And this is how we'd work day in and day out. Just carry on mobbing. So that's a good example of mob programming. I won't bore you by showing you the whole video. But that gives you an idea of the, the mechanics of the practice. And with that I want to talk about the what the roles are in mob programming and really they're just two roles. There's something we call the typist and then everybody else is the rest of the mob. And if you're the typist you have certain responsibilities, if you're the rest of the mob you have certain responsibilities. So the typist has three main things that they're responsible for doing. And their first thing is to press keys on a keyboard. That's it, really simple. The next thing is to trust the mob. Trust where the mob is taking you and to work with an, be comfortable working with an incomplete understanding. Um, so that trust and working with an incomplete understanding, those are a little harder to do. The pressing the keys is a really easy part. And I want to kind of talk about um, trusting the mob. So when you're the typist, you've got to trust that the rest of the mob knows where they're going. 
There'll be times when there's confusion and they don't know where they're going. And that's when you just slow down and you say, well, where are we going with this? Let me know. If there are discussions going on, that's fine. That's part of mob programming. Um, the right time to challenge design decision is after you've implemented it. So you don't want to have these long conversations before you've written code. You want to get something down. And then once it's working, then you can start challenging it and start asking for feedback and going where, uh, talking about where it is. The other thing is being comfortable working with an incomplete understanding. And that can be really, really hard for us as developers. We want to understand how something works. When you're in a mobbing environment, you've got to rely on the rest of the mob. You rely on their brilliance and let that come through. So, we've spoken a bit about the typist. I want to talk about the rest of the mob. So the rest of the mob has two focuses. They want to contribute to discovering what the next thing is in solving the current problem. Um, and they want to do it. So there may be many things going on. And the goal of the rest of the mob is to find what's the one next thing that we need to do and go after that. And that can take a bit of teamwork and a bit of collaboration and just figuring out how to work. The other thing is when directing the typist, you're going to work at the highest level of abstraction that the typist understands. So if people aren't following, you might go very finite and very detailed. Go to line 41, go to the third word, change that word. If you've got flow going and you're in sync, you can go, okay, we just want to write this test and get this test to pass and let the typist do that implementation. So getting those two things right, if you're doing that as part of the rest of the mob, you, you've got your roles right and you're going to go in the, in the right direction. So, um, collaboration is hard. Collaboration for a long period of time is even harder. And to work effectively, you're going to need to establish some sort of protocol so that we can work well together. And I found the best protocol to use when mob proming is to use the one that uh, Woody Zuel uses, oh. which is, oh, whoops. Continue talking. Which is trust, uh, treat people with kindness, consideration, and respect. So fundamentally, if you're focusing on being kind, considering where other people are coming from, and talking in a way that generally is acceptable, you have a good protocol for interacting. Um, so, when we talk about speaking with, uh, treating people with consideration, what do we mean? Fundamentally, we mean you've got to listen to the people around you. Um, and that is something that takes some time and takes some practice. Um, I can remember whenever a new mob forms, there's like some initial storming that happens as people try and establish where they are and whether we're in sync or not. Um, and it's really important in that storming stage, take a deep breath, like not get your back up and just listen to what other people are saying. And if people start to listen to each other, then you start to gel and you start to go in the right direction. So those two roles are really, really simple, and they can be really challenging to get right. Uh, being the typist seems like a really simple thing, and it can be a challenge to let go and listen to everybody around you. Being part of the mob also seems very simple, and it can be a challenge to actually listen to what other people want to do and talk collaboratively. But if you get those things right, you create an amazing platform for developing software. So I've taken you through the mechanics of mob probing. You've seen uh, how it works, and I've spoken briefly about the roles. Now I want to go into some of the questions that we get with it. Um, oh, sorry, and a quick, a quick punt. Uh, I've written the book. Ta-da! <laughs> um, this, I promise you, it's a work in progress. It's also the best book I've ever written. <laughs> um, and you can buy it now in Lean Pub. So if you're interested in the mechanics of mob programming, uh, go and check out my book. It will take you through some of the things you can do to get started and go into the mechanics of mob programming in a little more detail. And if you're not happy, you can always apply for a refund. <laughs> How's that? Making brown bags pay off.
<laughs> so let's talk about some questions that come around with my probing. And the number one question you get is the productivity question. Um, and it, at its essence, it goes like this. How can we be productive if a bunch of people are working on one problem at one computer? Surely if we have three people, we've inflated the cost three times. Like fundamentally, like how can we make developers productive? Is this not a very unproductive way of developing software? So I want to talk about measuring productivity. And measuring productivity is hard. I love this quote by Russell Aikoff. He says, managers who don't know how to measure what they want, settle for want, wanting what they can measure. And when we talk about measuring developer productivity, it's an extremely hard thing. How do you measure it? Is developer productivity the number of lines of code written? Well, if it is, awesome. Because I can automate that, right? Um, is it? Uh, number of stories completed? Is it how busy you are? There are all these things that uh, are hard to measure and so we end up measuring like side effects in the hopes that that's giving us an indication of productivity. So um, let me share a quick experience of mine. Uh, this was way before my proming. Uh, a friend of mine was working on a project well behind schedule uh, he was lucky enough that the project manager sat next to him so uh, he would regularly be asked for updates and uh, one day after just giving another update on how they were like once again we're behind schedule he sat at his desk and the, the product manager sits down next to him and just looks at him and after a minute says can you just type faster <laughs> So measuring productivity is hard because we think that when we're productive, it's because we're being busy. Um, when, when we started mock programming, we started uh, measuring how many stories we got into production. And this isn't, sorry, I don't know if the screen is that showing this too well. Um, so this isn't my specific team, but this is another team uh, that Martin shared that he had worked with that we had seen kind of the same thing. And you see this red line, that's kind of the average, and you see this blue line, that's the number of story, that's kind of the elapsed time to get something complete. Can you see where they started mob programming? It started about there, and you start seeing this line going down and down and down. Now, I don't know if that's actually an indication of whether uh, people are being productive or not, but it's an indication that things are taking shorter and shorter to get finished. Um, and that's kind of been my experience with mob programming as well. Uh, I've worked in teams that have tried Kanban as an approach and like one of the fundamental aspects of Kanban is to limit work in progress. So the fewer things you're working on, the more capacity you have to get things done. And kind of the saying we use in Kanban is it's not about starting, it's about finishing. Um, and we chased work in progress limits day in and day out for years. And we never really got to a happy place. So in the team that I was in, we had about six developers. And we thought, well, a work in progress limit of four would be awesome. Because that meant we were pairing and that we had a few things in flux. And we really got down to four. That same team, after mob programming um, for about three months, I remember looking up in stand-up one day and realizing we had one thing on the board. And it just blew my mind that for years we had chased trying to decrease our work in progress limit, but we hadn't realized a fundamental thing was that it's not the work in progress limit, it's how you're working that's important. And just by changing how we worked, suddenly the metrics were showing us a totally different story. Now the question is, like, is finishing things a measure of productivity? I would argue even getting things finished isn't a measure of productivity because if you're working on the wrong things, you're not being productive. So do you see how measuring developer productivity can be really, really hard for everybody? Um, so I wanna change uh, the way we look at developer productivity. And there's a really good quote that uh, 
kind of frames it. It says, transformation comes from pers pursuing profound questions rather than seeking profound answers. So instead of trying to find the answers of whether we have developed for productivity, let's talk about what happens or what destroys developer productivity. And this is where I'm going to encourage some of your participation. Uh, you've all been involved in writing software. What destroys your productivity? Anybody want to give out their personal favorite? I think it's interruptions. Interruptions, yes. Yeah. Interruptions reduce productivity because you're getting into something and then you have to change your train of thought. What else? Maybe priorities. Routine. Priorities changing. <coughs> so you're working on something and then, oh, this is more important, so we got to slot it. So you stop what you're working, you go start on something else. Yeah. So interruptions and priorities, is there anything else? Too many things, um, too many things uh, um, put on your plate. Okay, so juggling too many things at once, can't really focus on one thing, feels like you're not being productive. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Writer's book. Writer's block. Okay, do you want to just elaborate a bit on that? Um, yes, yeah, so um, if you've got a problem, you uh, you kind of like, you know, this, it seems trivial and yet you get stuck. You're stuck over thinking how to just approach it. Yes. And before you know, like, you know, this uh, time goes and you know, nothing gets done. Yeah, and often you use this technique called rubber ducking where when you go and explain the problem to somebody else, they don't have to say anything and you get the solution because you've just walked them through the problem. Is there anything else? Kind of opposite, uh, having too many ideas and wanting it to be perfect, so you're looking at the perfect solution and you never start. Okay, so just <coughs> never starting because there's too many conflicting ideas and you're not actually sure on, on what the right level is. Okay, we'll take one more and then we'll go into my list. Anybody else? Well, that's good enough. Um, so those are all great suggestions on what disrupts developer productivity. Um, I've put a list of things, some of them are quite common with uh, the ones you spoke about, so incomplete information, waiting for information, not really understanding what's going on, uh, defects in production. So you're working on something and now you've got to stop what you're working to go and fix something else, and then you can't even remember how you did that, so you've got to figure out how you did it to, to get it going. Um, being blocked, technical debt, code corrupt, like the code is just so bad, you ever wrote this nonsense that's left the organization and you're stuck with it, and now you've got to figure out what they were trying to do before you can actually solve the problem at hand. Uh, we've mentioned thrashing, meetings, just being endlessly in meetings, um, or do doing more than you need to do, so kind of just having too many things. So these are all things that uh, destroy developer productivity. Mm -hmm. Can you unpack thrashing? What's thrashing? Thrashing. Okay. So thrashing is a, a classic example I had was uh, a colleague of mine was working on something and he sat there the whole day trying to get this little part of the code to work. And when I sat down on a page with him, he said, man, uh, he was a .NET developer. So in .NET they have link. He's like, man, I think I've discovered a bug in link. Uh, and he had spent the whole day <laughs> trying to investigate this bug and link. Uh, and I said, well, show me the test that demonstrates that. Wrote a test like, oh, link works as expected, it was somewhere else. So he was just thrashing in one place. Meantime, it was somewhere else totally, and he just didn't see it. Does that make sense, mm, yeah. that term? Okay, so there are a bunch of things that destroy uh, developer productivity, productivity. What I've noticed is, while mob programming doesn't solve all of these, a lot of these issues just fade away when you apply the practice. Um, and I'm gonna speak about two things. So uh, the person I wanna speak about is waiting for information. Um, have you ever started on a piece of work, realized that you need some information about it, and the person that has that information is not available, so you have to wait for them, right? And while you're waiting for them, you don't want to be a bad uh, developer, so you start something else. So now what have you done? You've inadvertently introduced a context switch because now you're going to stop what you're doing when they're available and pick up their work, and then you carry on. So waiting for information can be a real destroyer of developer productivity. And uh, 
Indications are that contact switches can cost anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes upwards. So when you go and you interrupt somebody and you say, can I borrow you for a minute? That person to get back into their thought process and what they're solving can cost them anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes just to let their mind get in. So you can imagine having interruptions all day can absolutely destroy your productivity because you're switching, you're introducing context switches, and you're also going through like a human element of focusing on the problem and then trying to refocus and just being exhausted. So um, with mob chroming, that kind of falls away to a large degree. Uh, remember that work on that UI thingy that we did six months ago that we need to do to complete the story? No, I have no clue. But Igor sitting next to me does remember it and can take me right there. Uh, do you remember that business discussion about the problem that we were solving in that meeting that you missed? No, I don't because I wasn't there. But Darren was there and he's right here to share some information. So when you have this mob together, you have this collective mob memory and that increases the ability that you have to solve the problems at hand. Um, so I had a, an experience in the past um, where we had just started mob programming in the first team that I was in and we needed some information. And um, we went and asked the business person to come. Now, previously we would have scheduled a meeting with that business person. We would have gone through the problem. They would have given us the answers. Then we would have gone back to go and develop it. And while developing, we realized, oh wait, there are a couple other things we missed. So we need to go and organize another meeting for them. In this case, we'd started mob programming, so we thought we would try and experiment and we met at the mobbing station. The person sat down, we showed them the scenarios that they had, that we had. They identified two or three scenarios we hadn't identified yet. We coded the solution there. We pushed it out, it was in production. Meeting was over within an hour and we had solved the problem we had. What had previously taken us days to solve, we had solved in hours. And that's the power of having people working together at one machine. Does that make sense so far? Um, there's kind of a saying that we have in mob programming that if you're not able to answer uh, our questions that we have, then we're missing somebody in the mob and we need to go and find them. And that's really important. Like if you can't answer this, who can we get in to help answer this uh, question? That product owner that we saw when we were going through the mob programming video, he sat next to the mob for a reason because he realized that if he was near us, and he was able to answer our questions quickly, he got his stuff a lot quicker. And that was an incentive for him to make himself available. Okay, so another thing that destroys developer productivity is this question of quality. Um, and a large benefit that we've gotten from mob programming is that quality increases substantially. Um, now, if you look at the number of hours that it takes to work on a piece of work as a mob versus the number of hours it takes an individual to work on, initially, it actually takes more time as a mob than it takes for an individual. And often when we're comparing the productivity of developers in a mob to individuals, that's what we look at. But we forget the fundamental thing that something that a defect that gets into production takes a lot longer to fix than the defect we pick up initially. If we look at the same work and we keep that life cycle into consideration, mob programming suddenly becomes very, very viable because you're no longer fixing defects because you're not creating the defects. When I work on my own, the, the best of me gets into the code and all the worst of me gets into the code. When I work as a mob, the best of me gets into the code, the best of everybody else gets into the code, and we filter out the worst of everybody. And that has a massive impact on quality. I think even in the MYB space, in the Bumble Nauts, since we've been mobbing, we've seen quality increase. And that's, I think that's a gut feel right now, but I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see metrics that follow that. Um, kind of the principle that backs us up is a principle that originates from extreme programming, and that's the principle of diversity. And the principle of diversity says that if you have a mix of diverse people working on the same problem, you end up with a better, more robust solution than if individuals worked on it by themselves. 
and mob programming leverages that principle of diversity to a massive degree. So I've tackled just two aspects of developer productivity and mob programming. Um, I'm aware that we are running out of time and I want to go through some of the observations that I've had from doing mobbing. Um, and one of the questions that I get around mob programming, well, isn't mob programming just pair programming? Like, isn't this the same thing? You know, pair programming, two people sitting solving a problem, mob programming is three or more. This seems like just the number we're playing with. And there are lots of similarities. In fact, I see mob programming as an evolutionary progression from pair programming, but it's different. And one of the reasons is, well, it's different for two main reasons. The one reason is, have you ever seen two developers talk about something where they don't agree? Let's take, um, I wrote down a, a couple examples. Uh, UI frameworks, uh, the best text editor to use in the world, <laughs> which is clearly fun. Uh, how to name something, uh, or whether January should be encoded with a zero or a one. These are really, really important discussions. And when two people sit down, they can talk for hours and hours on end. The beauty of mob programming is it kind of democratizes those discussions. Instead of it being me versus you, it's a group consensus. And so we kind of go with the majority. Okay, I personally have this preference for this thing, but as a group, we've decided we're gonna go this way, so as a group, I'm happy to go that way. It's not a, as confrontational as pair programming where it's me versus you, and if, if I lose out in this, you've missed out on a, a major breakthrough in your uh, career as a developer. The second thing is uh, comparing pair pro with comparing pair programming is this concept of flow. So when you're in a pair, and somebody gets a message or needs to go to a meeting or is sick for a day, you lose flow. Like you fundamentally stop what you're working until that person comes back uh, because it's just hard to continue. When you have a mob, that flow continues. Somebody can pop out, go take a phone call, and when they finish with the phone call, they just join back into the mob and they keep going. Go into a meeting, that's fine. The mob just carries on. And when you come back, you sync up with it. And what that means is the most important thing is worked on the whole day until it's done. And that's the power of mob programming over pair programming is the flow is increased quite dramatically. Um, so I don't want you to get me wrong. There are massive benefits in pair programming. And I, I love pair programming, but I think that mob programming is one up on that that there's some real tangible benefits from being three or more people. Um, and that kind of like leads to an interesting question. I think the reason the XP folks came up with pair programming was when they originally looked at it, like the equipment that was around was only like monitors and stuff, like projectors weren't widely available, they weren't cheaply available, and so they ended up with pair programming. I think if we had had the technology and the hardware at the time, they probably would have ended up with mob programming. And that leads to an interesting thought. With the breakthrough in uh, virtual reality headsets and bandwidth, what are we going to be doing in 10 years time? What is the type of collaboration we're going to do in 10 years time that's going to move up from mob programming? That seems really, really interesting. Okay. So, some things we've learned from mob programming. And the first thing is, Ergonomics and working environment absolutely matter. Uh, a lot of our traditional workspaces are designed for single developers, at best two people. Mob programming, you need a bit more space. You need to be able to sit and be comfortable. We found uh, that if you work in a cramped environment, like the sustainability of mob programming decreases because you're just not comfortable. Um, so having uh, a large table where you can sit comfortably and everybody can feel like they're not being uh, encroached on is really, really important. Uh, next thing is, what's the ideal size of a mob? In my experience, is it's about four to five people. I, I avoid three because I found when you have three, if one person pops out, you revert back to pairing. Uh, in the teams I've been involved, uh, original team, we were very comfortable with five people because we had the 
work environment that allowed us to do that. Uh, in our current space where we're mobbing right now, it's very cramped. It's too small. And so we struggle to hit four comfortably. So uh, ideal size for me, four to five people. I've heard of mobs that have gone eight to 12 people at times. Uh, they've, they've been effective, but they don't sustain that for long periods. Like the excess people go away and do their own thing and come back. Um, the last kind of thing I want to share is you may feel exposed when you do mob programming. Now, if you're not comfortable um, speaking to somebody else and asking them to try something out, this may be a tough practice to embrace. It's really important that you're in a safe environment. And for some people, mob programming isn't going to work. Now, I would encourage people that feel exposed to kind of tackle that head on. Uh, not being able to work collaboratively with other people in this industry is going to like limit your career progression. But for some people, it's just too much. It can be really, really tough. Um, and with that, I just want to close with telling you, uh, sharing with you, like what an amazing journey it's been over the last two years of mob programming. I've had the opportunity to spend time with some of the best developers that I've ever met and learn how they approach writing software. Uh, my personal learning and growth has just accelerated from this. The quality of software I've written has accelerated. I could come out of a day exhausted, yet so excited to go to work the next day. Not only because we're writing the best code we've ever written, but it's extremely fun. It's very social. And I feel like we're actually making a difference. So is mob programming for everybody? Probably not. Is it something you should try? Probably. Um, and with that, like we've reached the end of the session. Like, thank you for coming. Are there any questions? Are you, are you doing it for all day stories? All day, every day? Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. Um, so, in our current team, no, we're not doing it all day, every day. We, we default to mobbing. Um, so generally, we want to mob and everything. Um, I think we are a little short in numbers. So at best, we have three people at a mobbing station. Uh, but generally, we'll mob for about two to, two to four hours a day. Uh, in my previous team, this was the default way we worked. We would do about six hours. We could never really do more than six hours because after six hours of mobbing, you're exhausted. And if you take the meetings and kind of the time that we spend for learning, uh, there's only so much time in the day. Uh, I don't say you need to mob all the time, uh, but it's really beneficial if you do. Um, and there's some real value text, not just pro developer productivity, but kind of a common understanding of what quality is and things like that kind of emerge as well. Yeah. So you talked a bit about environment and most of the picture you've shown there, at least from what I could see, the mob programming was done in team room. So what's the experience of doing mob programming in a big open space? Um, not great. Um, so, so one of the things that I like to talk about is upping the signal, dampening the noise. Um, and so being in an environment where you can up the signal, the people talking about the problem is important. Uh, and generally like big rooms, like the way we have our rooms designed in NYB, it, it at best is designed for pair programming. Uh, the cubicles are too close or the desks are too close to the walls where we sit. And it just makes it hard to, to sit comfortably. Uh, so I have a preference. In the previous team I was in, we also had a shared room but nothing was attached to the ground and we could just move things around and that made a big difference. So I think there are some adjustments we make to our desks and stuff that would just make it a lot easier. Uh, unfortunately, we're not there yet. How do you accommodate for, um, not the breaks, but when you uh, write in the code and say you need to just PPI reference or uh, some reference code and yeah. then you have to just go and Google what, you know, just go to documentation Yep. then what everybody does? Read the same stuff on the same page? Uh, uh, so different teams handle this differently. Like there's nothing wrong with sitting and having your laptop there while you're mobbing and somebody's actually preemptively reading these things up. Like I found that 
reading like an API manual isn't really effective as a mob personally. And generally what we would do in those situations is we'll do a time box separation. So we'll say, right, we don't understand this thing. We're gonna time box it for 30 minutes. We're all going to go to our desks and work on it. We're gonna get back in 30 minutes time. Different teams handle different, different ways. When you did mobbing at other organizations, did you find the mob would get interrupted from other people? Oh, so this is a big benefit of mob programming. People don't feel guilty interrupting a single person working on their own. <laughs> like, like, you have to really want a problem solved if you're gonna stop four people and go, sorry, I need to know this. So we, we would still get interruptions, like people would come in and talk, but generally uh, we found that uh, there were a lot fewer of them, they were a lot less trivial. Um, and also getting meetings with the people that were solving the problems was a lot easier because they go, I don't want to mess four or five people around, so I'm going to make sure I'm there. And so that for me was a really positive experience. Um, I don't know if that's a universally <laughs> accepted answer. Um, and also like kind of the protocol that we would have was if you did need to interrupt the mob, like we would educate people instead of stopping the whole mob, you just pull the person away from the mob. So you don't go to the mob and say, hey, John, do you know this? You just say, John, can I speak to you quick? Go around the corner, the mob carries on working. And when John's finished, he becomes the typist because that's the easiest way to ramp up. So generally, if somebody breaks away from the mob, like we bring them in as the typist because that, that's the easiest way to sync up with what's going on instead of um, trying to give direction on something that you don't really understand where it, where it is. Another thing we also learned was like, if somebody breaks away and comes back, don't explain to them what's happened over that time. Uh, put them in the typist. As a typist, they don't need to really think. They just need to do what they're told. And very quickly, they get up to sync. You basically tell, tell the typist that it's four I equals blah, blah, blah. And if he goes types in, that's what you tell him. Yeah. All right. But it, depe it depends, it depends on your level. Yeah, it depends yeah, right. on your level All of abstraction. Yeah. So, with, so, so as a mob works more and more together, like that level of abstraction naturally goes up because they figured out how they're going to work together. When you're starting, generally, it becomes like really, really detailed. And like, so one of the things we'll do in a, a mobbing environment is we'll always have line, absolute line numbers turned on because it's hard to say uh, halfway down the screen. You want to say line 39, three words across, go and change that. So that's like a little technique we learned. It's all in the book. <laughs> How's that for a plan? Um, should right. we do one last question or are we done? Well, only one. Yeah. Well, um, how are we on time? I don't want to go over. Well, we have, you have 15 more minutes. Okay, I'll do five minutes worth more questions than we call it. Uh, I've heard people talking about mob with QAs and DAs. Yeah. What's your experience Absolutely. and yeah. uh, how does it work and what do you think? Yeah, so, so we, we had an experience uh, the other day um, with our QA. Um, Sunita was, um, so we're trying to get the team to test everything uh, and drive that the responsibility for writing the tests sits actually in the dev space. It's quality analysis is making sure that we've covered all our cases. So the problem you have is when your QAs work separately from your devs, your QAs actually don't know what's been written in the automated tests and they do manual exploratory testing to ensure. So we had to need to come and sit with us. We walked her through our test scenarios that we wrote. Uh, we ran them so she could see they passed. She pointed out one or two things that we had missed and she, walked, she came over going, that was awesome. Like I have a lot more confidence in our developers that they're actually writing tests. <laughs> um, and I think she has a better appreciation for like how we're approaching the problem. So very, very effective. Generally from the BA side, like it depends what problem we're solving. If we're focusing at the business part of the problem, the BA is definitely there because we need to like get that information from them. If we're like doing a really deep technical optimization and the BA doesn't can't add any value, they leave. And the rule of thumb is like if you don't feel that you're adding value in the mob, find a way to add value or law of two feet go find somewhere else to add value. Um, and if you like apply that, you'll, you'll be in a good place. Any other questions?
cool. Well, um, thanks for coming. Like, um, we are mobbing just in the corner there. I know I've seen you yeah, pop by once or twice. <laughs> um, but if you are interested in trying it, 